So, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Rob and uh, Kate, who are going to take us through the next 15 minutes or so, um, sharing their work. So, thank you very much. Hello. Uh, I'm actually not any of those people. Oh. Um, <laughs> but, so, I just wanted to, to say hello and introduce these guys. So, just to let you know, I work for Pexit. Uh, we're on stand number four on the floor. So, if there's anything that you run out of time for today, these guys will be on the stand uh, with us. So, any questions that you've got after this, please come over and see us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. So, uh, I'll introduce myself. My name's Rob Cole. I'm a consultant paramedic by background. I've got 30 years NHS background, and I currently work for uh, the Emergency Care Intensive or Improvement Support Team, which is ACES, the part of NHS Improvement. My colleague. Hello, everyone. My name's Kate Pound and I also work in ESIS. My clinical background is nursing um, and I also work in a, another team in NHS England which is about innovation. So thank you. This is where I'll work out how to move it forward. Here we go. So uh, we're going to be talking about digital headset technology um, and we're doing the concept of it. So we're not talking about companies, we're not talking about specific hardware, we're talking about the concept of doing video consultation. That's certainly our part. Um, we're going to do a little bit about the history, the current situation, and what we see the future. And then we'd like to take some questions. So from a historical sort of point of view, so remote assessment, as we know, has been used in healthcare for many, many years. But one of the points that we've picked up is it's, it's fragmented. It's non-standardised. Um, so you can go from area to area. And one of the things we picked up as well... Can I just have the notes on that? Okay, I'm sorry. One of the things we picked up as well is that they're quite often it's been introduced as pilots or small bits of funding, so you never really tend to get that quality of... We now lost us, no? that quality or that, that, that full evidence basis. Um, we see a, a real sort of value in doing remote assessments, certainly when we look at ED avoidance and that sort of stuff, and that's what we're going to move on to. So the reason for possible slow uptake, and this was just some brainstorming with colleagues, and we looked at you know, the cost. Some of these headsets we'll talk about later, they're absolutely not cheap. And in terms of this, we're talking about remote digital headsets, and you may have seen them out on the floor. Usability and perceived usability. A lot of people look at them and they think they're complicated, how am I going to use them, and all the three-click technology, which we'll talk about in a bit. The accessibility, so how am I going to carry it? How, is it robust enough? Um, a lack of innovation. I think we found, certainly in our roles, that you know, people are just doing the day job. They're almost fighting fires. And is there that space to think about how can we do something different? You know, and it's that old sort of analogy. If you always do what you always do, you'll always get what you always get and all that sort of stuff. And it's about you know, being in the right space to look to do something different. The governance barriers. And I can't underestimate the, the governance barriers. And I think certainly from an NHS point of view, we love governance barriers. You know, everyone's got a reason why you can't do something. And some of it's entirely legitimate, so data protection, some Keldy cards, some platforms and some infrastructure. But actually we need to look around the governance barriers and say, how can we make it work or how do we make it work, rather than just saying it won't work or we can't use that. I think I'll talk about it a bit more in a bit, actually, but I think COVID has actually really given an opportunity to streamline some governance because it's been given that case to do something different. And I think a lot of projects we've been involved with that before we're going nowhere have absolutely moved forward. The interruptibility is a great word, but we all know about it. Systems don't talk. We've got system ones, we've got cleric, we've got EPR, we've got Sino, we've got all these different systems. They don't talk, they're fragmented. So about how do we work with that and how do we become interruptible? And finally, I guess, when you look at, if you take a paramedical workforce, that's staff reluctance. Do staff want to use it? Will they use it? And I think one of the things we talk about reluctance is, I think we're in a different world in technology. Let's look where we were 20 years ago with, you know, I'm not branding anything, but you had Nokia 3310s and stuff, and let's look at where we are now. People say, well, the silver surface, you know, are, you know, are they any good with technology? I can't get my dad off the phone. I know what he's doing on it, and he's probably not very good, but he's permanently on it. But also I've got my children who are also permanently on it. So technology is, is one of those things. And I work with colleagues, and, you know, the, the way they utilise technology is phenomenal. I sometimes think we shouldn't be the barrier for other people as well. So... Just quickly into COVID, I think COVID has really brought around this technological revolution, and it really has. And I'm just going to not name chat, but I will do Teams, various other platforms available. But actually, Teams were the big player. And I remember two years ago, we were camera shy. You didn't want to be on it. Nobody knew the etiquette. Everyone talked at the same time. You went on a call 15 minutes earlier and waited. You could kick people out. That was fun. You put your hand up and all this sort of stuff. And actually now, it's just the absolute norm. But one of the things I've said working with, with, with the guys and girls who are doing this sort of work is it might be the norm for us in the back offices. <laughs> it's not the norm. It, and actually, Teams hasn't come into the world of paramedicine. 
They've been doing the job, the same job, with the same equipment. So actually, because we're different doesn't mean everybody is. But in reality, I think COVID has really brought that forward a little bit. Yeah, I, mean, I was just going to remind, in our conversations yesterday, I was saying to Rob that actually we need to refer to, you know, the curves of innovation. I'm sure you've all seen this, where we, we use those unpleasant names like laggards at the end. But, you know, because, thanks because of COVID, you know, normally we'd have the curve, we'd have the early adopters, and we'd have that kind of like the gap. We talk about mind the gap, but when we think about teams, it literally has just gone up like that. And we really have to now think and take hold of that opportunity, because as soon as as we start thinking about, oh, we can breathe, we can go back to normal, that curve will flat back down again, and it will be, you know, oh, well, we used it in COVID, but we, COVID's over now, and we can go back to normal practice. And actually, no, this has led to real improvements for our patients. You know, my son, I always remember when we went for his outpatient appointment, uh, he's a teenager, and uh, because of the distance, we basically meant a whole day off school, and he came out and said, that's the day of my life, I'm never going to get back. And he was absolutely right. And then since then, he's then had the virtual appointments. And it's brilliant. You know, we can, almost, we can be doing it on the way to school, the appointment. And it's just like, you know, when we think about the generational change and what opportunities, but also about the expectations about what should be available, I think are really changing. And, you know, things might want to, you know, people might want to move back, but actually the, the users won't. So I think... We've got an opportunity, and we've really got an opportunity. So what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about, in this terms, talking about video consultation, digital headsets. And we've seen them in various different guises. But the one that I guess we're looking with, with Pexit, for an example, um, this is a through the eyes. So we use this in healthcare already, and we actually use it in paramedicine, but we're using it in sort of smartphones or holding an iPad up, or it's all quite clunky and quite remote and not very patient-sensitive. Whereas this is, you know, you can free your hands, you can look through the eyes, and it's that type of technology that, that I think has got a real purpose that, that we can use. So what are the benefits? And again, this is just brainstorming and not exhaustive, but the emission avoidance to me is absolutely clear. I cannot underestimate the amount of patients we're bringing into EDs, emergency departments, that, in my opinion, and in many people's opinion, far more important than mine, never needed to be in an ED. They probably never needed to be at a hospital. They're perfectly suited for a virtual ward, a referral into the urgent care services, be managed in a care home. Um, and I'm really passionate about this because actually, if you take the elderly and we take the over 80s, for example, the long length of stay of this group of people, their frailty, their deconditioning, um, the fact that actually we don't operate fit to sit as well as we should, we actually put people on a bed because we think that's nicer, but actually it's entirely counterintuitive. Uh, they might then be admitted. They go on to long length of stays. We did a small audit not that long ago, uh, and we do many of these audits, where we've got figures that will say things like um, over 80% of all patients in a 24-hour period that arrived at, for example, a large hospital never needed the services of an ED physician. And many of them never needed the hospital. So actually, this type of technology, we can try and put people onto virtual wars, video consultations, senior clinical decisions. We can stream or navigate. We can maybe refer for hot clinics or SDEX the next day. There's a lot of the patients, again, if I talk about that frail group, a lot of the patients end up finding where they need to be, but they find it so far down the journey. I wonder what harm has been caused. They eventually do get on a virtual ward, but not before, and I'm not... I'm not overestimating, there are genuine 17, 18, 19, 20 hour waits for ambulances. That's an absolute, that's a fact as we speak. And if that's not bad enough, there are genuine 20, 25 and 30 hour waits in an ambulance outside a hospital. That is happening. And it's not that that's 30 and the rest are 2 and 3. No, that's 30. And there's loads of 29s, 28s, 27s. And I don't want, um, not with us now, but I wouldn't have wanted my elderly nan, you know, sat in a hospital car park in the back of an ambulance, deconditioning on a stretcher for 17 hours when she never needed to be there because actually they will come to harm. But more importantly, where can't we be if we're there? We've not got any infinite resources. And if our crews are, are tied up doing this sort of work, so that's just one opportunity in that, in that, in that ambulance world that I think we need to look at. Um, the frailty, I think, is really important. I'm, there's various opportunities for digital headsets, so there's the whole critical care stuff, but I think I'm seeing that value in in slow time, turning emergency cases into slow time cases, doing virtual consultations with frailty consultants, with UCR services, and planning events in a, in a slightly different way. Um, probably moving on to Kate. Yeah, um, 
And the, the other opportunities around inequalities, when we think about it at the moment, you know, some communities have poor access to good quality. You know, you know the rural communities, you know, we talk about um, hard to reach um, communities, but also hard to reach care. So if you're in somewhere like um, Norfolk, to get to your nearest hospital is a long way. You know, your nearest decent hospital is Adam Brooks, and that is a long way. So let's even out and you know, talk about, you know, hard to reach, now become reachable because you can use these, this new digital world. Um, and, you know, in social care, you know, um, this gives us an opportunity to um, reduce the pressures. Staffing is such an issue, so by using digital technology, we can actually um, provide additional staff by better use of those staff. Um, and um, I was going to say, there is just so much we can do. Um, I was going to say about the challenge. So last year we were given a challenge um, by our team and by Tim Ferriss, and it was basically, you know, work differently. Work in a creative space, work with people you don't normally work with. And I'm a bit of a crazy person, in fact. So I went round the conference and our team were given the, this challenge in the fact that we were said, we need something that will help us by the end of December. We are going into the worst winter. We need something that will help us by the end of December. So I went around the conference and went to all, to all the different stands and said, what can you do to help to uh, um, reduce the number of unnecessary admissions into the emergency department? And this is when I met the PEXIT and they were like, oh, we've got this headset. And I was like, oh, cool. Could we use it in paramedics? Yeah, yeah, we could use it in this way. And we started the conversations. And, you know, it's being bold enough to have those conversations that actually we can get change and taking that step forward when it might feel uncomfortable. But actually, if we don't do it, you know, we're not helping the, our patients. We're not helping innovation. And I think just, just going back, thanks, Kate, when, when we look at that, the, the headset technology, that's the hardware. That's the piece you see. That's the Gucci thing, but it's far more than that when we're talking about, you know, for NHS, for example, or even the court systems. It's about the infrastructure. It's about the interruptibility of our current systems. It's about, can I record a patient assessment? Can that be linked onto my patient clinical record? Can that be stored for the required amount of time? Can I review it if I need to review it later and get to it? Is it held on the right servers in the right place? Can actually, I'm an ambulance crew, I'm transient across, I don't know, 15 different CCGs. Do I need a different thing for... Because we all know that's how it works at the moment. We've got, you know, the look at the director of services, and I, I looked the other day for an area, and, you know, there was 27 different schemes available for, for, for one outcome. I've got to work through all of that and work the times, the dates, the conclusion, the exclusion. What we don't want to do is create the same sort of fragmented system for this new technology. We want standardisation. That's what we need. Okay. So we're looking at putting these devices into two areas. We've got a large London hospital, that's happening as we speak, and they're using that, and actually it's going to be used by consultant to consultant conversations as we speak, and that's just, we're testing the concept. Can you hold the digital conversation? Does the bandwidth work? Can you hold it in a seamless way? And the area we're looking at is... So we're using it in a um, general hospital, um, but it has um, a community that's kind of like stretched out in the fact, you know, um, nursing homes you know, two and a half hours drive away. And at that point, the, um, it's really difficult for patients to get assessed to move into care homes. You know, everybody thinks, oh, you know, we just need to take the patient there and they move in. No, they have to be assessed. At the moment, it's trusted assessor, which is a written document. You, you send the written document to the care home, they take one re read of that document and they go, oh, no. So what we're going to do is actually we're going to give the staff and the wards the opportunity to wear the... Um, technology and they'll be connected to the care home setting where the actual manager, the assessor will be able to see the patient and you know we this will reduce the long admissions and will help those assessments and you know we'll reduce the number of no's and actually there'll be confidence and building trust with all involved. So my twenty five seconds that I've got left. Um, we need to do something here and now. We need to be cognizant of tomorrow. It needs to fit for the future, but actually needs to be done here and now. We need to just get on and do this and actually just put some stuff in place that actually has a benefit. We need to work with our colleagues from within and design. I'm not sure whether the headset technology is exactly where we want it, but if we've got a business case, there's enough people who want to wear it, let's develop something that actually meets the needs of what we need to do. And eventually, we talked about virtual wars. Will we get into a world where we actually get a virtual hospital? Who knows? Thank you.
you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you both so much. And if you're, if you're in the crazy um, gang, Kate, then I'm with you.